Hi, thanks for coming to this webinar on building your API platforms with Backstage and GraphQL. My name is Michael Watson, and I lead developer advocacy at Apollo. I've been obsessed with GraphQL ever since I started using it back in 2018. And I truly believe GraphQL makes your APIs better. I have a lot of other online talks where I go into more detail of why I believe that. And I've worked with a lot of different enterprises on their GraphQL adoption, and a lot of those have been in the context of an internal developer portal. And the developer experience behind GraphQL is fantastic. And the context of an internal developer portal, really you can enable self-service workflows around consuming and contributing to your platform APIs. So my goal for this webinar today is, is to share, you know, what I've seen successful at other companies and that starts with GraphQL and the architecture of your API platform. And then we'll come move into you know, how to integrate things uh, and the APIs into Backstage. So let's talk about the agenda today, right? So I intend to give a Backstage demo, but we need to discuss and digress a little bit into GraphQL just so we're all on the same page. Um, this includes a little discussion around the architecture, um, an architecture that we've seen successful and proven inside of uh, platforms built on top of GraphQL. Uh, then we'll actually get into Backstage and um, we'll show some tips of exactly how you can configure Backstage for GraphQL. There's also a repo that I'll share at the end of this that contains all the code and examples and screens I showed today. So what is GraphQL? Um, a common misconception I find is people think that GraphQL is a database. Um, well, GraphQL is not a database. Um, it's actually a query language. There's a spec behind it. Um, this was created in 2015, or it was open source in 2015 by Facebook. And uh, GraphQL is really what Facebook used to create their graph and how Facebook, their website, talked with their back end. Um, later on, Facebook donated uh, GraphQL to the Linux Foundation in 2019. And fast forward to today, um, we have the GraphQL Foundation. Um, so this is similar to the CNCF Foundation. You know, both of them are a part of the Linux Foundation. And I've been trying to personally work on connecting more of the GraphQL world with the cloud native world. Um, because many of the large enterprises I have worked with, uh, not only did they adopt GraphQL, they also kind of went the path of trusted CNCF projects, right? So they adopted Kubernetes or OpenTelemetry or Backstage alongside with GraphQL. So, GraphQL lets us approach requests in, uh, for data in a more natural way. And I like to think of this as three simple pieces. One, which is queries for fetching data. Mutations are for creating or changing data. And subscriptions are for real-time data. Now, all this is defined in a strongly typed schema, and this acts as a contract between your clients uh, and the server. And the schema and API start to provide a single place for all of your app devs to go get the data they need. And that helps drive uh, product mindset as well. You have a much more expressive schema here. And what I like to tell people is think of your GraphQL API as a digital representation of your product or your business. And one of the things people love about GraphQL is clients simply select the fields that they want to fetch inside of the query. So this allows the client to get only the data they want for that query and adding additional fields is just adding additional fields to the query. So really simple and uh, features that are put out there can be adopted by multiple clients at the same time. Now, you may be asking this question yourself or you might have heard this a little bit yourself. You know, what about REST versus GraphQL or is one replace the other? Um, to be honest, we've seen them work together, and uh, GraphQL really is just REST at the heart of it, right? It's a post request, and you can actually see the uh, query for the GraphQL operation is just in the body of that post request. Now, GraphQL also does support GET requests as well. Um, this is called persisted queries, and it's where the operation is actually hashed into an ID and then URL encoded into the string, and it enables you to do things like CDN caching. So overall, GraphQL simplifies the REST details for clients and how they get data. Um, we see teams move from REST to GraphQL for platform APIs because it provides a single consumer experience that's self-documented. You know, instead of having to discover into the APIs available on the platform, devs can explore the schema and write a GraphQL query that's strongly typed with validation. So they get little things like red squiggles, you know, underneath uh, problem areas. 
And overall, it really just simplifies your APIs. Um, I think it actually makes things very easy for backend developers as well. And we're gonna cover some of those details shortly around those self-service workflows. So let's actually get into some backstage. So here on the screen, we have just the default new created backstage app. And we have this APIs tab, right? So we're talking about APIs and what would things actually look like for GraphQL to live in this world? Well, first, before that, let's actually talk about what it looked like before that. So open API, right? If we have an open API definition, this is actually what that looks like in backstage. We're just using the simple pet stores um, open API definition example. But what's really nice is in the definitions, you get all of that documentation, right? So now a developer can come through, look through APIs, and then actually start to understand and, you know, what is the shape of those APIs? What is the, the surface area? And they can start um, self-exploring into this world. So how does GraphQL actually fit in? And like, is it any better? Well, before we jump into that, I think we need to talk a little bit of like, what's GraphQL architecturally look like inside of a platform of APIs, right? So I know this is an oversimplification, but generally speaking, API teams are generally creating services that use things provided by the platform team. And the API team's goals are really to meet the needs of the application developers, right? And so REST is a common choice by these API platform teams. Um, and like I said, it's oversimplification. This might not be how you have things structured. You know, it might be that you have the API teams actually own the domain APIs and the platform team is really just providing more of the infrastructure, um, IT aspect it, or some other way. Um, for the sake of today's webinar, let's just say things are generally architected this way. And the architecture shows app teams and API teams separately, but those also might be, you know, maybe a full stack team where that um, BFF is actually, you know, tightly coupled with that client application. Um, and there's good reasons for each one of these different architectures in, in each one of these scenarios, right? But platforms built with REST technologies like OpenAPI, they naturally create an architecture that really gives client applications two choices. One, orchestrate, you know, REST API calls with inside of the client. Most teams don't want to do that. And then the other is create an API service where the client can make one request to that API service. And then that orchestrates all the rest of the requests, right? And that's a, a pretty common pattern with inside of BFF models, all right? And this can actually lead a little bit to API sprawl. And it kind of leaves the uh, question of reusability across APIs, you know, not really a high chance of that happening. And devs still need to write some finite code to orchestrate those calls across the APIs and maybe some new services. So GraphQL Federation provides a better architecture for devs to contribute capabilities to the platform, right? And so what would GraphQL look like if we had just put a single monolith inside of the platform infrastructure, right? Most likely in these scenarios, what we've seen is maybe a single client application team adopts that GraphQL API directly. Maybe you have some of those backend for front ends or other API services start calling the GraphQL API versus those domain APIs, but it doesn't really give an experience for API teams to really contribute their capabilities to the platform. They're really just consuming the platform, right? And in reality, you actually might get something a little more like this, where you have a lot of different things happening, right? API teams don't really have necessarily the reason to switch to GraphQL, so they continue to use a lot of their existing things inside of there, right? And the platform team really should enable an, a, a pattern and architecture where teams can contribute in a self-service way to that overall platform. And that's really what GraphQL Federation provides, right? So with GraphQL Federation, we're really exposing those same APIs just with GraphQL, and we compose them together into a single artifact. Um, a GraphQL gateway is able to take a composed schema and construct a query plan to execute operations and route them across you know, the various APIs. And those APIs can be written in any language. They just have to be GraphQL. And there's lots of production uh, ready libraries uh, that you could use to really use any language that you want today. Um, the platform teams can provide GraphQL APIs that really expose the entities and the domains of the business. And then teams can build experience APIs that really extend off of these core entity domain experiences that the platform team's providing. And this is removing the need for any of that finite code of like, how do I orchestrate requests? How do I get the product from that product thing over there? 
Um, this is now actually coming in the form of, of that query plan. So wait, hold up. What's this GraphQL gateway thing, right? That's a, a, a new piece. So what is this GraphQL gateway? The GraphQL gateway is really responsible for routing those requests across all those available services. And so clients are gonna send their requests to that gateway. That gateway is gonna generate a query plan. I like to think of this as explain in SQL. It tells you exactly how is everything to be executed across the requests. So one client request can be n number of downstream requests to other services, and that's all determined by an optimized query plan. Now, a lot of teams will integrate external processes into their GraphQL gateway, things like authorization, authentication, um, things around security integrations, maybe that's like rate limiting, other things that might be integrated. The gateway also can export OpenTel Metri data, right? And so you can actually have an understanding of your graph's usage that could be provided as part of that platform experience. Um, there's also a way you can tap into the lifecycle events of each request coming into that gateway. And you can do things like trimming a query plan based on the authenticated user's scopes and policies that are provided, right? So we have these external processes that we might integrate into there. Um, and after that, the gateway is going to execute the query plan and send those requests to the necessary downstream APIs. It's going to then combine all of those results into the expected response for the client. And finally, the gateway sends all that data back to the client. So great, easy, right? But wait, hold up. How's that query plan actually get made? Well, the query plan is really going to be dependent on the gateway and the schema, that composed artifact that's being provided to it. And the gateway has to know about all of our APIs and all of those schemas, right? And so that all gets composed together into a single schema that we provide to the gateway. And this is really what that composed artifact looks like. I like to think of it as a computer readable version of the schema that contains you know, all of our schemas for all of our APIs along with some metadata and some hints of you know, where those things live. And this also helps us maximize uptime for our gateway because our gateway is no longer dependent uh, for startup on are our downstream services available, right? It's now dependent on this artifact that we can have created in CICD pipelines, right? Um, what I'm showing here or over, um, that is a, a policy CLI tool. It's free, it's out there open source. Um, that has a, a composition uh, command that you can use to compose all these artifacts. Um, you can head over to the Apollo documentation to download that. Um, but really the GraphQL gateway is using the metadata within a composed schema to generate query plans, right? So the gateway plans operations and executes them. But when, how's it gonna update, right? When those downstream services change, that router, that gateway, that thing, that's gonna need to update, right? So one thing that's really nice here is GraphQL actually uh, helps us with this architecture, right? So it's gonna need to fetch its initial schema on startup. Right? And this is something we can ship in the Docker image with the router. Maybe we have a, we can also have a secondary process that we run in that Docker image where it's actually fetching that composed artifact from a remote source. This is most commonly done with like a cloud storage, um, some aspect that they have in there. And one of the best practices that's popped up in industry is having a schema registry. And really this schema registry is something you wanna have because you might wanna do things around rollbacks or something in the future. And this is gonna enable that and make that a lot simpler. And there's a lot of open source offerings out there for schema registries. There's managed paid offerings out there. Um, and a lot of uh, other companies have the option of creating their own schema registry, right? They use something like S3, some cloud storage, and they create a service in front of it that's able to ingest a schema and create this composed artifact and put it out there for the router. So you really, you'll need a place for individual services to publish their schema when it's changing. Um, this is commonly referred to as a schema pipeline, right? And this is basically DevOps workflows around your schema and part of the magic that helps enable self-service API creation and updates, right? So downstream APIs are going to publish their schema into the pipeline using CI CD. And that's typically some service that's gonna process that single schema with the context of the rest of the APIs of the organization. And so the first step of that pipeline is checks, right? And this is where the schema is checked to ensure it follows some certain set of rules. And it really enables API developers to have, you know, some little check that happens inside of their uh, pull requests 
where they can have things fail if it's failing some of the rules of the organization or those checks, right? And those checks are really gonna be dependent on your, your organization, your use case. There are some common ones that have come out there, things like linting, um, things like doing a static analysis on the change for a schema, making sure that that isn't gonna break known operations that are running in production. These are all examples of checks that you might want to have run, right? Now, if all those checks pass and everything, this is where we're gonna to wanna to have composition happen and create uh, that new updated API schema um, and put that into our registry, right? So after that successful composition, that's gonna get uploaded into our registry. And then the gateway should hot reload based on that upload artifact in the schema registry. And this is where you can run that secondary Docker process to pull your schema registry for updates, then provide it to the gateway um, to have a hot reload experience. Now, I know this might all seem like a lot. Adopting new technologies always have some level of this feeling. We're showing you how to roll your own basically here. Obviously, there's some considerations here that we're not going to be able to cover in this amount of time. This is also you know, what Apollo does help scale things out so you can focus on your API platform. Um, so if you wanted to get into that more, you can always reach out to us at Apollo. I'm happy to talk more. And you can also click this link to join our Discord community um, or uh, contact Apollo. And if you want, you can always reach out to me and I'll, I'll do my best to help guide you along the right path. Okay, so we took a little detour here, uh, talk about some architectural pieces, but I think it was important to review. Um, I've worked with a lot of teams on their internal developer portals with GraphQL, and they end up having to tackle different teams owning services that are exposed in a single common graph. Um, you definitely can be successful with a monolithic GraphQL representation, but for the internal developer portal platform API use case, uh, a federated architecture is going to um, be more beneficial for contributors to that API platform. So now let's get back to backstage, right? So um, we talked about how the API platform is something that supports really applications and API developers. So first we're gonna continue focusing on the teams contributing to the platform, right? And so we had that tab, right? How should things be actually listed in here for um, our various APIs? So first we need to define a system, right, for our GraphQL gateway. Now I'm using the term SuperGraph here, um, and SuperGraph really is just something that's caught on in the GraphQL community, and it refers to a gateway that's using a composed schema, and, and really the composed schema is what powers that SuperGraph. Um, this is the system we're going to use to relate all of our APIs to. Now this is a basic configuration for uh, an API, a GraphQL API. Um, we can add this into our backstage URL, um, but we're missing the spec definitions for this. And, and in backstage, that's the actual GraphQL schema here. Now, just real quick sidebar, um, you may have noticed this like Spotify showcase inside of here. Uh, I just wanted to point out, um, I'm using a GraphQL APIs from a demo I've worked on in the past called the Apollo Spotify Showcase. Um, it's a Spotify clone that uses their REST API and creates a GraphQL API representation of it. Um, so all the code is available here, open source. Um, it's a more detailed example of what we're getting into here. So if you want to check anything out after this, this is a great resource. So in that demo, we have our schema files next to our catalog info. Now we can simply point at that schema file in, in our catalog info, but you might also have a code first framework that you're using as a library for building out you know, your GraphQL APIs. And that means you don't have necessarily that schema file. Um, or maybe you're using a server library that actually does some things to the schema on startup. Maybe it's like adding some things into the schema. And it's not 100% right when you have it. Um, either way, you might need to process the schema file, and you can do this fairly easy in GraphQL. Um, first, we need to read in the schema and the catalog info. Um, if you had your code first framework, you'd just need to run an introspection request against that server, and uh, you'd replace that schema here. Um, most of the libraries out there actually support exporting the schema to a flat file, and you'd be able to just use that. Um, next, we need to build the schema and print the definition to a string. Um, there's things for building a schema and printing a schema that are available in any of the community GraphQL libraries. It's just part of what's available through what's 
uh, described in the specification. And lastly, we just need to update the catalog info with that schema. And this, of course, is something that we are going to want to do inside of our CI CD, right? So here's just an example of a real quick and dirty GitHub action that, that runs, you know, any time that, that schema file chains and commits an update to that catalog info. And now Backstage is going to be able to refresh and stay up to date with that API repos catalog info. Perfect. And so the Spotify showcase actually has two APIs and here's how they both look inside of Backstage when they've been uh, entered in. And similar to Open API, we get a Docs Explorer for GraphQL. And this enables you to browse all the types in the schema along with any comments associated with them. So when people say GraphQL self-documenting, this is actually the part of, or one of the parts of what they're talking about here, right? API developers now add comments to their schema and those are now just inside and provided into our tool. And one hint, uh, if you have any entities defined in your API schema, you can quickly view them by just selecting the entity um, in that definition explorer, which is really nice. Now, I'm not talking about backstage entities. I'm talking about entities you're defining inside of your APIs, inside of those schemas. Um, and we don't have these entities registered in backstage as like backstage entities. But you could imagine doing something like that in the future and maybe querying Backstage's API for all the available entities in your platform, right? So there's a lot of stuff you could do with that, but this is kind of the, the starting point. Um, you also get a nice clean way to show, you know, what are the various APIs that are part of that super graph along with their owners. You know, this is, of course, something you get out of the box. Um, but, you know, now that we're associating all these APIs with that super graph, we now can have context into that. Now, we talked a little bit about, you know, how should we get those services to start to look like in Backstage. But what about creating new services, right? What, what are we going to be doing there, right? And this really is templates. You know, self-service API creation is going to require that you have templates where those teams are going to need everything they need to get from, you know, new template to production. And this includes things like registering the schema, you know, using that CI CD environment, whatever you have set up, right? And so you can use any language to write your service with, but like realistically, you, you just can't support any language. It's just too much to handle, right? And we typically see companies standardize on about two to three languages. Um, and we recommend having a gold standard template, right? If someone was going to come to you and ask, you know, what language should I use or like what's the best happy path? You should have that recommended template and have that called out so you can increase adoption in that world. You know, there are a lot of common server language options we see out there. Um, TypeScript, Java, Kotlin, .NET, Go, Python. Those are all popular ones. Um, there are plenty of other available options. Just those are the more popular ones I've seen. Now, your templates, like I said, they're going to have to do uh, all of those things in the DevOps workflow and publishing into that schema registry. Um, here's a simple example uh, from that repo where we're actually using GraphOS as the schema registry. But the idea is you should really have a service that you're able to send um, a schema to in just a, a single command, right? And that's something that's going to need to be able to run in your CI CD um, environment. Now, like I said, there's open source options out there for schema registries. You can build something yourself, but you're going to need to have for that self-service API creation workflow, you're going to need to have each one of those APIs registering their schema into a place. Now, if you don't have a template or a starting point, um, we created some that you could use. Uh, so that Rover CLI that I've mentioned a couple times, that actually has templates available in it for a couple different languages inside of there. Um, so you can install that CLI with our universal installer. Um, that's in our docs and, and in the, the slide notes here. Um, but that can give you a starting point. It has everything you need uh, around the GraphQL aspects for that language. It also includes Docker file for that uh, specific service. Should be able to just install packages, start up, and then it also has a little test suite to kind of get you started off on the right pattern. Now that we've covered some workflows around API creators, let's turn over to application developers, right? So consuming data in the graph is important. And the good news is we have a lot of great options for doing this right in backstage. Graphical is one of the things that's been around for a very long time in the GraphQL community. 
Um, it's a GraphQL foundation project supported by the community. Um, and it has everything you need to make GraphQL requests. Um, it's a free plugin uh, in the Backstage repo, fairly simple to configure. Um, you can support multiple environments through tabs, which is really nice. Um, so you can have things like pre-prod, staging, all easily accessible next to a production environment. And you can also provide your own fetch API. So maybe you have some authentication scenarios, or maybe you want to use uh, you know, one of your logged in backstage authentication providers to generate a token behind the scenes and inject that into the request that's going on here. Um, that's a nice experience and something that's pretty easily capable. Um, Apollo Explorer is another free plugin option available to you. Um, that's also in the main backstage plugin repository. Uh, the plugin has the option of connecting to an Apollo account, but that's not required. Um, I'm, of course, a little biased here, but uh, I think Explorer has just a better developer experience, in my opinion. Um, it has everything that graphic, Graphical offers, um, and it, it has a, a couple additional things in there. Uh, so you can actually click to add fields into a GraphQL query, and there's a little bit of a better searching experience inside of Explorer. And um, I found that that's pretty important when you start getting into very large schemas that's part of like a platform API. Um, and, you know, one of the other things is really the, the sharing options uh, inside of there. Um, so it, it has a, a lot of options of, you know, how you might want to uh, share an operation, copy an operation, format an operation. Um, one of my favorite is actually um, doing the uh, copy to curl command. I mean, if you look at this example of this curl command, you know, this, it's pretty intense, right? And uh, sometimes I like to test things simply and like try and remove all of the factors. And a curl command is actually really nice to be able to do that, right? So I can just like create whatever operation or maybe find an operation that's been running in production, copy that to a curl command, and then just run that in my terminal. And that's just perfect. It can also handle uh, requests, auth requests, and you know, um, handling custom uh, uh, functions on any requests coming from the API, just like what Graphical has. Um, so that's a, a, a nice thing that I'd recommend in integrating in either of these plugins, whatever option. Another thing is uh, Explorer has context for query plans. So you can actually see the query plan, which is pretty nice when you're trying to debug things, um, especially if you're, for example, trying to uh, break apart a service. Maybe you're trying to remove a type into its own API. Uh, you'll actually be able to take a known operation and see that query plan change based off of that schema and maybe like a local or dev environment, right? So now each developer kind of has this great experience of querying the graph. And although the best part is it's all completely visible as needed, uh, it's all just a single GraphQL endpoint for application developers. And that's great, right? It, just like any other GraphQL endpoint. So we've gone through a lot this session and we learned a little bit about what GraphQL actually is. Um, we also talked about the architecture with federated GraphQL and how it fits within an internal developer portal powering an API platform. Then we kind of jumped into Backstage and we showed what it could look like with some simple configurations. And that kind of broke down into three areas. One, cataloging our GraphQL APIs in Backstage and having it have a look that's similar to what we get with uh, OpenAPI. And then creating templates for applications and APIs. You know, teams need to be able to create new apps and services, and you can provide a happy path for them with that. I mean, if you don't have a GraphQL template, remember we have templates available through Rover. It's a great place to start. They're all free and open source. And third, you can consume GraphQL APIs right in Backstage, right? Through Graphical or Apollo Explorer. They're both great free available options. Uh, with some simple plugin configuration for your Backstage instance. Now, if you want to check out the code for the Backstage instance I was showing or anything else you can find in this repo right here. And if there were some you know, additional learning, I collected all the links and the various resources we went through today and put them on this slide. Um, if you want to talk to Apollo about scaling out your GraphQL um, in your platform API efforts, this link can get you in touch with our team. Um, I also added a link to a free trial if you wanted to try out uh, our managed schema registry without talking to anyone. Um, you can connect all of that to the Spotify Showcase demo if you want to fork that project, play around. All the instructions are inside that repo. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this webinar. I hope you found it helpful and if there are any questions at all 
or maybe something that you're hoping to figure out, feel free to reach out to me. Have a great day.